just came back from a trip to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And I was on the road there and the road back. I was thinking about an image I've used many times in the past, that the path of practice we're following here is like the road to the Grand Canyon. It doesn't cause the Grand Canyon to be. And the fact that you're following the path doesn't cause the Grand Canyon to be, but following the path takes you there. Following the road takes you there. But this time going to the canyon, we entered by one road and came back by another, basically two roads to the south rim. And they illustrate the path, dangers on the path, in two different ways. The road coming from the south bears no resemblance to the Grand Canyon at all. Which is why many people object to certain parts of the path. After all, we're going to a goal that is totally unconditioned, and how can the path be conditioned? We're going to a goal that doesn't require any effort when you're there. So why should the path require effort? That's the way it is. After all, why should the road to the Grand Canyon look like the Grand Canyon? And the Grand Canyon itself is not a road. But to get there, you have to make an effort. When you're standing at the Grand Canyon, there's no effort required at all. But to get there, you do have to work. It's not just a matter of letting go or accepting things as they are. You really do have to put together the causes that can bring the path together. Virtue, concentration, discernment all require work. If virtue were easy or natural, it wouldn't require training. The Buddha wouldn't have called it a training. Same with concentration. You do have to put an effort into it. It's a very delicate effort in the sense that it requires a lot of precision, but it requires a lot of dedication. And same with discernment. You have to think things through from many different angles, look at them from many different angles. Be as carefully observant as you can. This is one of the reasons why the training traditionally is an apprenticeship. You stay with a teacher, you try to find a qualified teacher, and stay with that person for at least five years, maybe more. Because as the Buddha points out, some people are like the tongue that can taste the soup and immediately know the taste of the soup. Other people are more like the spoon that sits in the soup and never knows the taste. And staying with the teacher is not just a matter of learning about the Dharma or learning about the Vinaya or learning about the techniques of meditation. It's, it's a total training. Because if you're going to be observant in your meditation, you have to learn how to be observant outside. And what may seem like little things or unimportant things. Where things are placed, how we can save money on the, our heating bills or whatever, it may seem to be a f far thing away from nirvana. But going to nirvana requires that you be observant. As John Lee once said, when you live in a monastery, your eyes have to be as large as the monastery. In other words, you have to see what's going on. Not that you make it a burden, but you have to be observant and do what you can. This may seem like a petty issue, but it's not, because if you can't observe the things outside, you're certainly not going to observe the little things, the little tricks the mind plays on itself inside. And those are often the things that really stand in the way of insight. So you have to accept the fact that there are certain features of the path that are not like the goal at all. As Ananda pointed out, we're here to get to the point where we don't need food anymore, and yet going the path requires food. We try to go beyond craving and conceit, and yet there's a certain amount of craving and a certain amount of conceit. You have to have the desire and you have to have the confidence that you can do this path if it's going to succeed. So that's one type of danger. 
The other type of danger is illustrated by the road coming into the south room from the east. You go along near the, the canyon of the Little Colorado River, and the hall you know about canyons is what you've read. You might think you've reached the Grand Canyon. After all, it is a canyon. It's relatively big. It's only when you actually get to the Grand Canyon that you realize that the canyon of the Little Colorado River is very small and it's nothing at all like the Grand Canyon. And this illustrates the danger that there are some parts of the path that mimic what you may have heard about the goal. And this is why there are people out there who think they've gained awakening or they think they've gained stream entry or whatever when they haven't gotten anywhere near. And I seem to be encountering more and more of these people all the time. And some of them have been certified by their teachers. But the question is, are the teachers qualified? Have they seen the Grand Canyon? One of the worst things you can do to yourself in the practice is to assume that you've reached a noble attainment when you haven't. Because that really cuts off the possibility of genuine discernment from arising. So I always have to be cautious. Feelings of oneness, feelings of light, feelings of spaciousness. These things all come under the factors of concentration. A sudden opening up can be what's technically called a neurotic breakthrough. It's not a good term. It sounds like you're becoming neurotic. Actually, it's a breakthrough through a neurosis that you've been carrying around, you suddenly realize you don't have to carry that around anymore. A very strong sense of coming into the present moment, and being freed of a lot of the narratives you carried around. Well, that too is the canyon at the Little Colorado River. I've talked to people who say fairly nonchalantly that they've, oh yes, they've experienced the deathless. There's no big deal. You know, deathless is a big deal. But if you think that what you had was an experience of the deathless, again, that just cuts off any possibility of further progress. So one of the things you have to be careful about is not overestimating your attainments. When something happens in the meditation, just put a little post-it note on it and realize that it's just a post-it note. And if you have no idea what it is, okay, put a question mark on it, and then watch it for a while and see what it does. Or if the idea that you've reached a certain attainment comes in the mind, notice how the mind reacts to that idea. And if you can see the defilement in your reaction, okay, you've come out ahead. You've learned an important lesson about the mind. So when you think about the path to the goal, think about those two roads to the Grand Canyon. They illustrate different dangers on the path and important principles to keep in mind as you practice. This is a conditioned path. You do have to be fired by a certain desire and a certain passion, because after all, the path is fabricated. As the Buddha said, it is the highest of all fabricated phenomena, but it is a fabrication. And all fabrications require desire, and they all involve effort. And the discernment comes in, figure out how much effort is just right. This is one of the big lessons you learn as you practice concentration. How much pressure do you have to put on the concentration to maintain it, to keep your focus steady, to keep mindfulness continuous? And how much effort is actually getting in the way? In many ways, practicing concentration is like relaxing into a yoga pose. When you first get into the pose, you feel kind of stiff. And the patterns of tension going through the body. But as you stick with the pose, you begin to realize you can relax this muscle, you can relax that muscle, and you actually get more comfortably into the posture, into the pose. So as you sit here and meditate, you're relaxing into the pose of a still mind. And as you see different layers of activity 
falling away or the potential that they could fall away, and yet you can still maintain the concentration. That's one of the ways you'll gain discernment through the practice of concentration. These are some of the issues of the road coming in from the south. Is the road coming in from the east? Just always keep in mind. It doesn't really matter what name you put on things. The question always is, does that experience really put an end to suffering? And you have to look again and again and again. to see what levels of suffering there are that remain. Because we're not here for status. We're here to cure the, these really bad habits we have, creating stress and suffering for ourselves when we don't really have to. <laughs>